dawn in Mecca. It is a legendary city, made famous by the generations who have longed to reach it. Mecca is a year-round destination for Muslims, but the numbers will surge dramatically months from now, during Hajj season. The lives of Mecca's more than one million permanent residents and the city itself are utterly defined by the presence of the Kaaba and preparations for the Hajj. Sometimes I have a hard time convincing people that we never stop preparing for Hajj. We prepare for Hajj every single hour. You know, during Hajj, immediately after Hajj, before Hajj. Hajjis are our customers and we cater for them in a customized manner. If you can imagine having 20 Super Bowls in one stadium, where two million people will come to the same stadium. And if you add to that, that these two million people will actually be taking part in, in playing the game as well. It may give you a glimpse of the preparations needed for the Hajj. Part of Mecca's mystique stems from the fact that only Muslims are allowed to come here. Mecca sits in the western mountains of Saudi Arabia, in a sanctuary roughly 100 miles square. Since long before Islam, it has been considered sacred territory, where no one could hunt, cut trees, or fight. At the heart of the city is a great mosque called Al-Masjid Al-Haram, and at its center is the Kaaba. All religious faiths have a center this is probably an essential part of the religious mentality, of human spirituality. In Islam, that center is there in the city of Mecca, centered on the house towards which all Muslims pray. Muslims don't worship the Kaaba. They worship what it represents, the one God. Beneath its cover, the Kaaba is a simple stone building that stands 50 feet high. Inside its golden doors is an unadorned room. According to one Muslim tradition, the Kaaba was built by Adam, based on a cosmic plan handed down from God, and then rebuilt by Abraham after the Great Flood. On its southeast corner, framed in silver, rests something called the Black Stone. Some believe that it fell from the heavens and that it was one of the building stones used by Abraham. Many pilgrims try to touch or kiss the stone, but most would be happy to simply lay eyes upon the Kaaba. Fidelma O'Leary is about to travel far from the heart of Texas to Mecca to make her pilgrimage. But first, she has a little physiology to take care of. Can give you an insight into your own physiology. Dr. O'Leary is a professor of neuroscience at St. Edward's University in Austin. The O in O'Leary may tell you Fidelma wasn't born in a Muslim family. She was raised Catholic, and by the time she was in college, she was already questioning her faith. I was listening to a call-in radio show and some guy called in and said, well, what I don't understand is this. If Jesus was God, how could he worship God? <laughs> For Fidelma, the caller gave voice to a yearning and questioning turned to conversion. This is what I think of as my light bulb moment. This was the moment when all the pieces finally locked and clicked. And I knew that Islam was the religion for me. I just embraced it and loved it, and I was the only Muslim I knew. Fidelma prepares to embark on Hajj, having fully embraced the faith. But she may be surprised that some pilgrims may struggle to embrace her. A world away, South Africa. In the lush countryside outside Pretoria, radio commentator Khalil Mantlazi takes to the air every week, inviting people to Islam. 
You don't need to tell the people that you are repenting. For Khalil, shaped by the racial strife of South Africa, Hajj is a chance to see an ideal world of Islam in action. God accept me. The most important thing to gain is brotherhood and sisterhood. God doesn't look to your face. God doesn't look to your body. God doesn't look whom you are, millionaire or what. God is looking for what? Your heart. Khalil seeks a world of tolerance. But in Mecca, he'll find some of the ghosts he thought he'd left behind. To the east in Malaysia, Ismail Mabot is about to find out what he's really made of. But in a desert, not on a fairway, wrapped in towels, not a golf shirt, bearing his soul to the Almighty. It's more like a spiritual trip. Yeah, it's more like forgetting what the backgrounds that I have or what I'm used to in the office, in the golf course, in the home, and just be near to God. Ismail's an executive with all the trappings of success. He's making the Hajj with his wife, Asma. They'll be gone for nearly seven weeks, leaving behind four children and a long list of do's and don'ts. No, 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 no. No way, you drive the car. Going on Hajj will be a challenge for Ismail, a man used to satisfying most of his material needs. But the Hajj is about the ethereal. The only thing he really needs to bring is the austere clothing of a pilgrim. As far as the Hajj is concerned, the dresses that we wear are so simple. Just these two pieces of cloth, yeah? These two pieces of cloth that we wear one down and one up. The Hajj is a quest for redemption. But no matter how well he prepares, Ismail doesn't know what he's in for. I'm set. For almost 1400 years, Muslim pilgrims have been bringing their private pleas to this place. But pilgrimage to Mecca is far older than Islam. How old it is, there you get into the question of legend and history. But definitely the pre Islamic Arabs practiced the pilgrimage to Mecca. The Islamic belief is that the prophet Abraham instituted the pilgrimage. Abraham, father of monotheism, father of the Jews, Christians, and Muslims. It is Abraham's story that lies at the core of the pilgrimage. Many of the rituals of the Muslim practice were established by Abraham. Most notably, the submission to the one God and the Hajj, which is the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. According to Islamic tradition, Abraham came to Mecca with his wife, Hagar, and their son, Ishmael. God commanded Abraham to take Hagar and his infant son and abandon them in a desolate valley in what is current day Mecca in Saudi Arabia. He returned to see them from time to time. On one of those visits, God asked him to build up the Kaaba and call the people to pilgrimage. For generations after Abraham, those who worshipped the one God answered his call. But over time, idol worship came to dominate the Kaaba. Then in the early 7th century, everything changed. A new prophet emerged from the line of Abraham. He was a Meccan named Muhammad. In the year 630, the prophet Muhammad cleared the Kaaba of idols, returning people to the worship of the one God. The Prophet Muhammad saw himself as a restorer of the pilgrimage as it had been in the days of his father Abraham. And although the pilgrim imitates Muhammad in his pilgrimage, the pilgrim believes that is a restoration of the steps of Abraham. Many steps of the Hajj connect to traditions of the past. One is the creation of the new cover for the Kaaba. It is called the Kiswa a 7,000 square foot silk drape. The black cloth is hand embroidered with verses from the Quran in gold-plated thread. 
and costs nearly $5 million to make. At the height of the Hajj, the new cover, weighing about a ton, is draped on the Kaaba. In this remarkable footage shot by National Geographic in 1967, King Faisal arrives to perform the ceremonial washing of the Kaaba. Today, one doesn't refer to the king as His Majesty, but rather as the custodian of the two holy mosques. At the end of the annual ceremony, the new Kiswa hangs in place, its golden letters visible to all who circle the Kaaba. But to see it up close, you have to get to Mecca first. At 2 a.m. in Kuala Lumpur, 12-year-old Afaf Mabob offers a traditional Malaysian send-off to his parents. This scene plays out on doorsteps around the world, as it has for more than a millennium. It was an epic journey, requiring months or even years of travel. Because of bandits and disease, it was filled with peril. When people said goodbye to loved ones, they didn't know if they'd ever see them again. Today in Malaysia, going on Hajj means participating in a highly organized government program, a model of efficiency. But there will be obstacles, because the logistics of Hajj are staggering. More than 20,000 pilgrims will travel from Malaysia alone, a fraction of the nearly one and a half million flooding into Saudi Arabia. And although Mecca boasts thousands of rooms for hire, most pilgrims will still have to share. Many of them tend to a room. For people like Ismail and Asma, this is the easy part. Once processed, they'll get a police escort straight to the plane. Not everyone's journey is so carefully choreographed. On the main road outside the village, Khalil hops a public bus to the airport. For the first time in his life, he'll not just face toward the Kaaba and pray, he'll actually go there. Hajj takes place in and around Mecca. It is a series of rituals performed between the 8th and 13th days of the last month of the Islamic calendar. First, pilgrims travel a few miles from Mecca into the Valley of Mina, where they find a massive tent city. There they rest. The next day, pilgrims continue to the plain of Arafat. This is the most important day of the Hajj, a day of reckoning, one-on-one -on -one with God. Then they return to Mina to perform a ritual stoning of Satan that continues for two more days. In the epilogue to their great journey, they return to Mecca to circle the Kaaba. While circling the Kaaba is the final act of the pilgrimage, it is also the top priority for pilgrims when they first get to Mecca. Fidelma and her group have just arrived after spending a week in the holy city of Medina. Most pilgrims feel it's imperative to visit Medina, where the Prophet Muhammad is buried. Fidelma is now aching to get to the Kaaba, but the mental and physical trials of her pilgrimage are just beginning. It was 11 hours in a bus. 
we had to adjust our attitudes and just be very patient with everything because I guess they're moving so many people into the city and having to keep records on everybody and so on. I'm sure it's a nightmare. So. Especially on Hajj, I think, because we know that we have to be patient. We're in the state of Ihram, we have to be patient. The state of Ihram is essential to performing Hajj. Ihram is a pure frame of mind that places a premium on patience, courtesy, and respect. Men are required to change into special attire that is also called Ihram. Two pieces of cloth, similar to the Islamic burial shroud. In this outfit, rich men and poor, educated and illiterate, all look alike. The clothes pare the body down to the basics and put the soul on center stage. By bus and on foot, pilgrims pour toward the symbolic center of their faith. They chant their commitment to worship and serve the one God. This is the theme song of the Hajj, the Talbiyah, and pilgrims will chant it hundreds of times in the coming days. Here I am at your service, here I am at your service. There is nothing worthy of worship but you. Here I am, Allah, at your service. For Muslims who have prayed in this direction every day for years, seeing the Kaaba for the first time is almost overwhelming. Every day, five times a day. Let's go from here. I can't believe it. Let's go here. Fidelma joins tens of thousands of worshippers circling the Kaaba in a rite called Tawaf. They go around seven times, as did the Prophet Muhammad. All races, all nationalities, all people in one place, concentrated, all in one direction, worshipping the one God. This has to be very powerful. Then on aching legs and swollen feet, pilgrims perform another ritual called the Sa'i, or striving. In this rite, pilgrims walk between two hilltops seven times reliving the heroic effort of Hagar, searching for water in the desert. Ismail and Hagar were left behind by Abraham in this desolate valley. And Hagar started getting desperate because her son was very thirsty. So she started running back and forth between these two hills to look for this water. Up until the 1950s, pilgrims walked between these hills right out on the street. Today, they are enclosed within the massive structure of the great mosque. They hustle between these two hills called Safa and Marwa. They're not supposed to walk. They're supposed to fast walk so that they can replicate this urgency, this need, this striving, this desperation that Hagar had for water. Her faith paid off big time. Angel Gabriel appeared and took the tip of his wing and struck the ground and out came this beautiful gushing water, which is called the Samsam water. Pilgrims still drink this water today. The markets of Mecca have long made the journey good for the wallet as well as the soul. In the past, pilgrims came from far corners of the globe carrying spices, silks, books, and carpets to trade. Can we ask for one of these? He didn't want to break the set, so now I have 11 or 12 here. So all my shopping is done, kids. I'm coming home. <laughs> Everyone's getting prayer beads. <laughs> it's a carnival boat, so to speak. So you just become part of the crowd. About 80% of Muslims today are non-Arab. People are here from more than 170 countries, steeping the city in ever more international flavors. <laughs> Still, when it's time for prayer, everything stops. Shops close. Streets 
become places of worship. On the eighth day, crowds circling the Kaaba have diminished to merely hundreds. The multitudes are on the move. Now to the Valley of Minna, where the Prophet Muhammad stopped and rested on his Hajj nearly 14 centuries ago. Khalil has chosen to walk in spite of the desert heat. I can't afford to walk. It is how Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us how to perform the Hajj. And he was a man of six something years. Why not me that I'm now on the 40 years? that I can walk, I can uh, jump, I can even run. I think I can afford to do so. Mina is about five miles east of Mecca. As recently as a decade ago, when it wasn't Hajj season, it was an almost empty valley. But over the past few years, the Saudi government has put up nearly 44,000 fire-resistant tents to house the pilgrims. This is a town that grows from virtually zero to two million people overnight. Ever since she landed in Arabia a week ago, Fidelma's been on the run. Today she's taking it easy in the tradition of the prophet, pausing before tomorrow's trial of the soul begins. It's not a vacation because there are stresses and the time schedule is totally topsy-turvy and. Everybody's off their sleep pattern. I don't know anybody that's had a good night's sleep for seven or eight days. Tall, fair Fidelma catches the eye of many people here. Yet, it isn't the gawking that puts her off. A beautiful woman may also be noticed in Texas. But comments are harder to ignore. I had some women in my group and some women who were strangers to me try to tell me what it's like to be a Muslim and ask me, are you really Muslim? I think they forgot for a moment that you can only be here if you're Muslim. It gets a little bit tiresome day after day. It, it, it can be upsetting. Still, since she's in a state of ritual sanctity, she must be patient and persevere. Khalil, too, has had his patience tested. Khalil, I think he's walking. Yeah, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. He's already left. It seemed to Khalil he wasn't being treated the same as other South African pilgrims because he's black. It's not at all what he expected on the Hajj. It is very painful to see this condition happening during the Hajj, since we are here always in one community, not looking to the color and not looking to the race, or whether you are rich or you are poor. When we are here, indeed, we need to respect the human being. Halil is shaken. His vision of brotherhood seems under siege. Yet he's in a state of ritual sanctity. If he loses his temper, he will violate Ihram. So Halil moves on. He joins up with another group from Malawi. Allah Akbar. At dawn on the next day, the camps stir with anticipation for the greatest day of the Hajj. Two million people are off to the plain of Arafat. Some 50,000 vehicles clog the roads. They may be air conditioned, but often it's faster to walk. Arafat is eight miles east of Mina. It's the place, Muslims believe, Adam and Eve found each other after exile from Eden. And it's seen by many as a rehearsal for the Day of Judgment. Hundreds of thousands approach in a great wide wave of humanity, singing the anthem of the Hajj. The chant embodies what the pilgrimage is all about. It's the fulfillment of a covenant, and it is the declaration of the oneness of God and the glory of God.
Pilgrims actually have to be within the clearly marked boundaries of Arafat, or their Hajj may not count. The Prophet Muhammad was even more direct when he said, Hajj is Arafat. We are now getting inside the boundary of Arafat. That means any time we can have a rest, we can sit. Real estate is at a premium here. Thousands are lost in the confusion. Babies are born. Elderly people die. Yet in the middle of the chaos, the inner search goes on. Khalil finally finds a patch of ground to rest. Like others more affluent, Ismail is in a tent with mattresses and tea. Fidelma leaves the security of her tent to climb the Mount of Mercy, Jabal Rahma. This is where the Prophet Muhammad gave his final sermon in the year 632. Many pilgrims are drawn here, seeking a nearness to the Prophet. But the essential search on the day of Arafat is for absolution. The important thing is the utter mercy of God. God loves people. He is able to obliterate everything that they've done that is wrong, and he's able to give them grace. It's judgment day. All the trappings of life sort of fall away, and you see these people in front of God Almighty, and that's all there is. A strange quiet descends in the afternoon as people turn inward. It's called the standing at Arafat. In this realm of forgiveness, Khalil finds a semblance of the equality he seeks. It can remind you of the day of judgment when God is going to gather all the nation together. No discrimination. If you look left and right, you found the women, men are standing up crying to God to show that all of us, we are one in front of God. Ismail, who has all he needs in the material world, tackles a poverty of spirit. Most of our uh, dua or prayers to God will be heard and hopefully, you know, will be granted by Him. It all depends on how strong is your asking from Him and how real is it, you know, or is it just hypocritical things like that. So how sincere are you, you know, when you ask for forgiveness from Him and ask for some good tidings from Him. Surrounded by millions, Ismail finds himself utterly alone before God, pleading for relief from an unspoken burden on his soul. Just now I feel very lonely. God. <laughs> I got emotional about it. <laughs> you know, we are actually communicating with God. Okay. And then one more time. So. so, it's only God knows what is in my heart. So, so at that moment of time, I'm alone. Okay. Have mercy on my father who passed away. And to ease my mother's life because she has Alzheimer's and from the outside in her life looks very hard. Thank you, God, for responding. I'm looking for you. Thank you for coming to find me. Please, God, hold on to me. You can't just sort of live life 
confess and be forgiven and then go back and live life. The, the, the real point is that you improve yourself. When the sun has set, can pilgrims leave Arafat? Nearly two million people stand poised to move as soon as the sun dips below the horizon. toward the white tents of Minna, where tomorrow they will engage in a symbolic battle with the devil. Here, Muslims believe, God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, but the devil challenged him not to. One story says, Abraham pelted the devil with stones, three separate times chasing him away. Three stone pillars mark the spots where Abraham stood his ground. At a place called Muzdalifa, on the way to the pillars, pilgrims pick up pebbles to stone Satan themselves. I'm going to use these stones to cast Satan out of my life and cast temptation and obsessions out of my life. Two and a half million people here. That's the estimate. And everyone's getting 47 stones. So two and a half million times 47 equals two bazillion. And that's a lot of stones. 49. <laughs> 49. I thought I was getting 49 because I was getting two extra. 21 times 2 plus 7. 49 is enough. So yeah, but you, yeah. There's a bit of confusion about just how much punishment Satan should get. Yeah, 70 you get all together. 21 plus 21. 42 plus 7. 49. Though the guidelines may be a bit arcane, the goal is clear. Defy temptation. I figure I'll, I won't hit it every time. It doesn't have to hit the pillar. It's quite far, you know. It's like a it funnel. Just... It put it there and like they have in the malls in Dallas and somewhere, you put a coin and it rounds, rounds, rounds and goes in the bottom. Fidelma prayed at Arafat for forgiveness and for those she loves. Now she asks her friends to pray with her. Whenever I pray for her, right here tonight I'll get. So I'm planning something really good. <laughs> She's divorced, and she'd like to meet a man who is her equal. Who will be very compatible with me in this life. Mm -hmm. And who will share paradise with me in the next life. Someone who's very good, who loves God, who loves Islam, mm -hmm. and loves me. So, what do you think? Can you pray me up one of these? It's tradition to sleep under the stars as the Prophet did at Muzdalifa. But Fidelma and Amina don't sleep at all. They want to stay ahead of the crowd. So just past midnight, wearing masks to keep out the dust, they head back to Minna. They know that in the next 24 hours, two million pilgrims will converge at one of the most dangerous intersections of the Hajj, the largest of the three stone pillars. When God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, most Muslims believe it was Ishmael, the elder son. In the Bible story, it was Isaac. Either way, it would have been agonizing for Abraham. He started having some doubts, and he realized that these doubts were really coming from the whisperings of Satan. We don't know exactly what Satan would have said, but it was something like, what do you think you're doing, killing your son? Are you crazy? He gets very angry and he throws a stone at Satan and gets rid of him one time and Satan comes back again because it's his job to misguide people. And the third time he comes again, he threw another stone. So there are these three stoning points that during Hajj people reenact. The ritual is called the Jumrat. In days to come, they'll stone all three pillars. 
This is now a moral statement that the believer affirms that there is good and evil. There is justice and injustice. There is righteousness and sinfulness. I loved the Jamarats. I thought as a ritual it has tremendous power and my training is in neuroscience. The more ways, physically, mentally, spiritually, verbally, the more ways that you try to contain the evil and the temptation, then I think the more effective it's bound to be. I thought from a scientific point of view that that was a really good ritual. Over the last 48 hours, pilgrims have sought forgiveness and rejected evil. Now, in a show of humility, they cut their hair. Some men even shave their heads. I have to read some prayer, you know. It's a tradition of our prophet, our beloved prophet, that we must uh, take out our hairs and take a bath and take out our clothes, hair up. After days in a state of ritual sanctity, everyone now reverts to normal clothing. But by cutting their hair, they make a physical show of their new state of being. Even as hair is cut, stones continue to fly. The ritual stoning of Satan is often dangerous. People have been crushed and killed by the surging crowd. To ease access to the pillars, the Saudis built a two-tiered pedestrian walkway, a kind of spiritual superhighway. Pilgrims can now attack Satan from above and below. With only a day remaining to finish their obligations, pilgrims crowd the pillars with growing intensity. And there's a wildness in the air. Why do Muslims go to Hajj and cast stones and throw slippers and turbans and all manners of things that they have? What is that really signifying? They're trying to get rid of those inner urgings that they have towards evil and not doing good. The battle with the devil marks the beginning of a celebration for Muslims on the Hajj and around the world. It's called the Feast of the Sacrifice. And it too is directly connected to the story of Abraham. As Abraham is getting ready to now slaughter his only son, Angel Gabriel appears to him and says, you have fulfilled your mission and replaces Ishmael with a ram. And then Abraham sacrifices the ram in place of Ishmael. We'll bring the sheep here and he say, Bismillah, Allah Akbar, as a symbol of all Muslims. Over 2,000 Muslim butchers have been recruited to undertake the largest ritual sacrifice of animals on the planet. We reach to seven uh, to 800,000 animals. Rules govern what each pilgrim must offer in sacrifice. It's one sheep per person. Seven people can go in on a camel. By the time it's over, millions of pounds of meat will be processed, packaged, and shipped. The name of the pilgrims to poor people around the world. With all other rites complete, pilgrims return to Mecca for a grand parting visit. <laughs> 
They have all earned an honorific title. Haji for the men, Haja for the women. For Fidelma, the last few days have been cathartic, joyful, and sometimes sobering. Muslims come from everywhere, from every place and from every walk of life. Perhaps the Muslims who are from, you know, majority Muslim countries need to realize that a little bit more. There's going to be a lot of green-eyed Irish Muslims coming here and blue-eyed British Muslims coming here and Muslims from the U.S. There's going to be all sorts of looks, more and more, I think. Hajis now bid farewell to the house of God. It is a final climactic call on the Kaaba. It's a time of sadness, a farewell. It's saying goodbye to a place that you love and a place that you probably don't want to leave with the thought that you may never see it again. I would doubt that any pilgrim comes home the same. Each pilgrim will go home with a clean slate and the chalk to write their lives anew. They want to be a better person. It's just a general statement, but I know what it means. I want to be a better father, better worker, better leader, better subordinate. I want to play a better role of whatever role that I'm supposed to be in. Though sorely tested, Khalil's ideals remain intact, bolstered by his time at the Kaaba, where he witnessed a kind of Islamic brotherhood. People, different colors, women, men, children, being together with the love. I said, God, great, you are so great. I thank you to bring me this place, to see the place where all this event happened. Here I am, indeed, I thank you, God. In his final turn around the Kaaba, Khalil comes so close that he can brush the golden doors with his cap. When I return back at home, I must give away what I learned. Fidelma is swept into the Tawaf, at one with her fellow Muslims. You really want to go in hand, you feel you've been invited. God wants me. And it's a really good feeling. And then you get here and you look around and you see there's millions of other people. And you're like an ant. And your significance is suddenly down to zero. It's a paradox, but it's a good paradox. Pilgrims arrive alone in a current of a million strangers and go home riding a spiritual wave of rebirth. A very happy moment for me was when this large African man helped me find a space and then he looked at me and said, American? And I said, yes. He said, you Muslim? I said, yes. And he said, Alhamdulillah, praise be to God. And I really felt welcome.